Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. There is no guest today. Uh, instead, I do this once in a while. So uh, instead, I'd like to share details about another one of my ongoing content projects, the Project Failure Files, and how my co-host, uh, fellow MVP and RD Sharon Weaver, how the two of us are trying to help people become better project managers, operations managers, you know, anybody that manages projects, uh, product managers, program managers, kind of at all. Um, we are doing this in a slightly different style. It's we're discussing what not to do in project management. Uh, and so today I wanted to, again, get, provide an introduction of the project failure files, uh, which is a show that was launched uh, officially, I guess now technically we just did 14 episodes, so 14 weeks back. Uh, there was some planning before that. But what this is, uh, the Project Failure Files is a podcast series, a uh, live stream, you know, webcast podcast um, dedicated to helping project managers, operations leaders, and business owners navigate common pitfalls in project management. So Sharon and I both have extensive backgrounds in the space uh, for years. We talk about it on the show, some of our backgrounds, but I've been in IT for over 30 years. And for the, about the first half of my career, I was largely in PM type roles and actually consulted and built uh, PMOs, built operational teams, um, ran uh, you know, operations and support groups at, at uh, three different companies. Um, and so, but always kind of in and around the project management uh, scope. And so we've started to identify these patterns and my, my co-host Sharon and I, um, where we were approached by a publisher about writing a book around project management. And we came up with this idea of anti-patterns in project management and uh, uh, you know, what, what not to do. So learning by learning from our mistakes. And we thought, oh, this is a great project. We uh, were a bit frustrated by the conversations of the control of our own content. And so we are still planning to write the book. Uh, it's underway, but uh, we are um, shopping around for a publisher. We might self-publish uh, or we might just do what we're doing is online, putting the show out there. Um, so we share our personal stories, lessons from real world experiences, and practical strategies uh, to help our listeners avoid those common mistakes and improve their overall project management skills. That's the goal. Uh, it's to provide that mix of theoretical concepts and that practical, actionable steps. What can you actually, by listening to this, what can you go and do? So you could, if you're experiencing that issue, that problem, go and take immediate action and apply it to your projects. If you've not yet caught the live stream uh, or watched one of our episodes out on YouTube or LinkedIn or one of the other social platforms, um, I've got a couple short clips just to show you some of the interaction between Sharon and I. There's no guests. It's the two of us. We both uh, have been around long enough that we have plenty to talk about on each of the topics. Uh, and so I wanted to share these two clips from uh, the most recent show uh, and how Sharon and I tackle a topic. So this is part two of an episode that we called the tool trap, which we did early on in the series. We covered kind of the back half of what we wanted to talk about. There's just around, you know, tools, technologies around project management. There was just a lot to talk about. Um, so that's where these clips come from. So the first one uh, in this episode is we discussed how project managers often become too dependent on their tools. They neglect critical human oversight and decision-making, which can, of course, stifle uh, creativity and reduce flexibility uh, for the organization. At the same time, many PMs are also failing to fully utilize available tools. That's another problem. One end, they're too reliant. On the other side of that, they're not utilizing the technology enough. 
and they're or, or not using them to their uh, full co- capability and potential, which can lead to inefficiencies uh, and missed opportunities. So in this first clip, uh, Sharon and I were talking about the need for stronger communication. Of course, communication is a theme that comes up. It's recurring in most of our episodes, talking with, with poor communication being one of the primary causes of project failures. Uh, so here's the clip. But having a knowledge base where you are entering every question asked and with that answer. If somebody's asking a question that's already been asked, then you're pointing them to the answer to that question in uh-huh. the tool. And so part of that is you're training people, one, to ask more questions, and they'll uh-huh. ask more if they're getting answers uh-huh. uh, and being as responsive as, as possible there. Um, but that then becomes an ongoing asset the next time you turn around, you, you're you developing a repeatable process. The next time you're deploying a tool is if you're following that same framework. And you know that the right answers are going out consistently because you're pointing them to the same information as opposed to it being different every time. Yeah. So I hope you like that. Uh, feedback loops are an important topic. I'm doing a session later this fall uh, at a conference in Europe on the on that topic of feedback loops and talking about various technologies and and best practices for giving pathways to f- feedback from customers, partners, employees. We talked at length about uh, how you need to have all these different feedback loops. Why? Why have multiple channels for providing feedback? as part of your overall communication strategy. And some people may not be comfortable with, I don't know, raising their hand in a meeting, for example, uh, or or publicly submitting a concern of a project or a risk or something to a group forum where they feel like they're, they could be judged or, you know, everybody has that, you know, that, that issue, that imposter syndrome at some point. Um, So you should have multiple methods. It might be regular one-on-ones with stakeholders. It might be uh, having uh, an anonymous uh, form that people can go submit uh, so that uh, it's just easy for people to provide that feedback. Uh, The point is that with more feedback, you get more data uh, and you'll have better outcomes because of that. Okay, one more clip that I wanna show you. Um, And this one, Sharon and I are talking about the importance of regularly reviewing your processes and tools. So part of your operational, you know, optimization, which is an ongoing thing. You might be, have the perfect technology rolled out and everything's efficient, but what happens is that you get new employees with different backgrounds. You have changing business requirements. You have outside factors, the customer and partner impacts that change. Uh, uh, that perfect system where it may not be as perfect. So you need to constantly go in, fine tune, adjust based on what's happening in the real world um, and incorporating that into the tools that you're you're measuring. So um, in this next clip, Sharon and I are talking about the importance of regularly reviewing processes and tools, taking in feedback, so feedback mechanisms from your, uh, uh, from your users around specifically your project management solutions, your tools and platforms for tracking, for code management, for whatever the the tools are that you do your jobs with um, internally, but making, and also making performance metrics, uh, you know, of your tools, part of your monthly or quarterly operational optimization, make it part of that holistic view, your governance plan, for your organization that you're constantly looking at the tools and the systems as part of that. So here's this clip. Have you also um, you know, thought about like, or, or ever utilized metrics for tracking the success of the technology in your org? Like I, I mean, I've seen like general surveys, uh, you know, my, my team at Microsoft and other companies, you know, since then where I, I, my team or myself, I manage the uh, the internal as well as partner and customer uh, uh, feedback, like the the annual survey, the the pulse survey mid year around that. Mm-hmm. We'd always ask internally about you know questions around the tools, mm-hmm. you know, but it was always high level. It wasn't specific, and I don't recall there ever being metrics around tracking 
around the effectiveness of the, the, the technology. So somehow incorporating that feedback yeah. and the performance of those tools. Like we talk about it in our, the customer, so the solutions themselves, but you know, to, to say like, how many tickets did we have open in, in the year or in our, one of our goals is to reduce the number of tickets by improving the quality of this solution. Like, have you done that for like your PM tools? Yeah. So, I mean, for PM and other tools, um, I've done Six Sigma projects around that and I've done client work around that. Um, I did a really nice Six Sigma project where basically we were trying to prove the value of, of needing to switch a tool. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a similar thing where um, they, the tool that they had, which really wasn't a tool, um, <laughs> they had, they had kind of a, a kludgy homespun, you know, way of doing things. Um, and they were wanting to move to a better tool. And so we did, we exa did exactly that. So we did some, um, you know, what is, what is the value we're trying to achieve? We did some surveys, we did some testing, we did, you know, we did some different ways to get metrics. And I think the biggest thing is what is it you're trying to accomplish back to that? What, what problem are you trying to solve? And does the tool you have solve the problem that you think it's solving? And so we did some baseline, um, surveys where we basically had people test, you know, I want you to do this test case. Case and I want you to track how much time it took you and then, you know, kind of what, what your level of frustration was with the, you know, time that you're doing this. And then do you have any other comments? And so we did this baseline test with the way that they were. We then took a pilot group and we rolled out the tool and we gave, we gave them training and all of that on it. And then um, uh, a little bit later, we went back and we did another round of testing and said, okay, we're going to do the exact same use case test that we did previously. We're going to do it again. And um, it gave us some really valuable insights because ultimately we were testing the exact same task. You know, can you do this? How do you feel about it? How long does it take you? And what we noticed is like at the beginning, it was like our results were like it took them, you know, on average over 10 minutes to find what they were looking for and accomplish the task. And most of them were very frustrated and half of the people gave up because they were just like, no, I don't want to do this. After we implemented the tool, it was like, you know, they found things in, you know, less than a minute. They were very happy with it. They they were able to achieve the task they were trying to accomplish. And that gave us some really great insights into, you know, you know, the tool is doing its job because ultimately it's solving the problem. It's making people feel good about it. They're getting their tasks done. And so I took that lesson learned early on in that project to then go into my clients. And anytime my clients were like, hey, we want to know, you know, are the tools we're using successful? Are we getting the value out of the tool? Are we, um, you know, implementing this properly? Whatever. Mm -hmm. Now I can say reliably, um, based on this past project, if you kind of do some baseline metrics around what it is you're trying to accomplish, gather that information, and then however often you want to do it, maybe right after you implement, maybe a little bit down the road to see not only is it better, but is it continuing to improve um, that, you know, problem that you were trying to solve, uh, you can see the metrics of what that tool change did. And then if you really want to drill in and get super specific, you can say, or what are the things that we did to implement the tool and start you know, doing surveys around those steps too. But yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's really valuable for organizations to understand because a lot of times, like you said, we turn tools on, we turn tools off. We don't, we don't care. Like, are they using them? Are they not using them? And nine times out of 10, we only change if somebody's screaming because they're in pain. They either, you know, the tool they have is wasting their time and, and frustrating them or they don't have what they need. We don't think about those subtle kind of in-between values beyond that. Well, and this is such a great point that Sharon makes because we're not just uh, proactively tracking and measuring the effectiveness of our um, project management tools. Uh, most people, well, like we install them, they're running, they're in the background. We don't think about it. And so we're, we're, uh, often going too long, experiencing unnecessary pain and potentially risk uh, by having outdated tools that should have been replaced. If we have the feedback mechanisms uh, in place and we're tracking these things, if it's part of our monthly or quarterly holistic view of our system, so that systems thinking, systems planning, um, then we're going to keep the system more optimized. And as a result, our project teams will be more effective and more efficient. So I hope you enjoyed those clips. Uh, they came from episode 13, if you're interested, which is called The Tool Trap. You can find it out on my blog. Of course, part one is episode four, part two, episode 13. Um, 
yeah, we're, we're, we're jumping around on topics. There's, there's a, there's a rhythm to it, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, part two was a bit delayed there, but you could find both of those out on the blog. And of course the recordings are out in LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook and a bunch of different places. So uh, you can find those. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, talked about feedback loops. We would love your feedback on these. So if you uh, have suggestions or a topic that you think we need to discover, uh, discover to uncover, uh, if there is a particular pain point that you've experienced with your project, your management of project, of product, of all those different areas, please let us know because we are constantly adding. Uh, in fact, we have identified, um, I think I, uh, you know, I think I have the number here. So I think we currently have 40, yes, 40 different episodes that are defined. So with this part two, it's actually 41 recordings so far. Um, though these are different topics that we plan to cover in the consecutive week. So rain or shine, holiday or not, every Monday uh, morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, we have a show that's going live. If it's a holiday or Sharon and I are traveling, then we don't do a live show. We have pre-recorded, but it runs at the same time and we run it as if we're live and usually one or both of us if we're on the road we're still on there monitoring answering questions so it's like it's live um so uh, i did want to before i i go i wanted to share just again some other the themes other topics that we're covering so the tools that's an important topic um and and where we re re talk about the over reliance on technology uh, uh and the underutilization of uh, you know, all the capabilities, all the features of a solution. So some of the uh, things that we talk about, we also cover the cultural aspects of each of these topics. So for the tool trap, we talk about how, uh, how some organization cultures tend to prioritize tool efficiency over human decision-making. So I, I would always refu re refer to this as managing by spreadsheet. So we're so focused on what the tools are telling us, we're failing to have conversations with people. And I've shared in a few different places, but a great example of this where they had a senior director that was uh, was making the case for one of our senior uh, support personnel uh, to be fired because uh, the average number of tickets closed in a month that he had a fraction of that number. Um, but th that was by looking at the spreadsheet, by looking at the dashboard. Here's what the data is telling us about the tools. And what she failed to realize by just having conversations with people, um, and, and he was not let go because he was one of the most senior, if not the most senior, one of our uh, um, uh, our support engineers is because he was taking on the worst, the ugliest tickets that no one else could go and fix. And was actually working very closely and was our liaison with the product team to get these problems solved. So while everybody else was closing 50, 60 tickets in a month, he had five or six. Uh, and so, uh, you know, but again, moving past what the tools are telling you, what the dashboard's telling you, and actually talking to people, that's important to not, uh, uh, not replace the, the human inter interaction. Um, teams often resist adopting new tools due to a lack of training or a fear of change. And so from a cultural standpoint, again, you might have the latest, greatest technology, but if you don't uh, uh, solve those, you know, the ongoing training issue and the fear of change, I mean, change management, there's a reason why you have a whole slew of, you know, experts, consultants that do nothing but work with companies on change management. Um, that's a big part of what I do in projects when I work with with uh, companies as well, because the company that is better at identifying and uh, uh, mitigating and running with change is going to have a, a huge competitive advantage over their competition. Um, so some of the uh, actionable steps that we recommended. So provide training to ensure team members understand both the limitations and advantages of their tools. Promote flexibility by integrating tools into workflows without becoming dependent on them. So actually talk about how people are using the technology. It's not just about knowing what the features do of how you're tracking time and inputting you know, data, but how does this fit with the overall workflow and the culture of the organization? 
and then conduct regular audits and gather feedback to ensure the right balance between tools and human oversight. You can go and track the effectiveness of tools, but if you're not then doing an overlay on the culture of the organization, then it may not stick. Uh, people may, again, push back on those recommendations. Um, so that tool trap was a great topic. Um, another great topic and kind of a theme is this idea of micromanagement uh, versus empowering employees. So that is a running theme. So micromanagement is a common issue that stifles creativity. I'm sure most of you have experienced this. All of us have experienced it at some point in our careers. And it discourages team members from taking ownership and often leads to lower job satisfaction. One of the blessings that came out of the pandemic and uh, organizations like looking at how are we working, how are we going to be able to work remotely with all these people um, is that they there's a lot of empathy that was created, a lot of recognition that um, there are positive aspects of not commuting and working from home. And there are a lot of negative aspects of that. How do we do this? We need to kind of change the, the, the culture and micromanagement through hybrid, through virtual employees is very difficult and it can very quickly, there are tools that uh, track mouse movement, for example, to see if people are actually working. And uh, there are tools that there are things that you can buy that can mimic movement of a mouse to trick that system. Um, people are like water running down a hill. You put a rock in front of them, the water goes around the rock. Um, once people understand how they're measured, they will find ways to optimize their performance against those metrics. Um, so some of the cultural issues around micromanagement that we discussed, um, some managers believe tight control is necessary for success. Uh, and it's really rooted in a fear of failure. And it's not trusting in the quality of the employees that you've brought on. Um, Sharon and I talked about uh, one of my, on this topic, one of my favorite books is uh, by Marcus Buckingham called First uh, Break All the Rules, which the core message of that is to um, identify as you hire people, as you start working with them, to enter, identify with their strengths and manage to people's strengths uh, as, as best you can. Like uh, I have an article that I wrote years ago called The Myth of the Well-Rounded Employee. This idea that we have, there are people that are like that. They're just good at everything. But the vast majority of employees have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. And the, as a manager, as a project manager, as a people manager, um, it's a strong skill to be able to identify what the skills are of your, of your, the strengths are of your employees and to use them that best leverages those, those strengths. So do that. Um, so uh, what are the other uh, cultural issues? Organizational cultures that emphasize individual responsibility over collaborative success can foster micromanagement tendencies. So this is where if you have an organization, a culture where you want hero employees and why aren't you as good as that, that hero employee that does everything right kind of thing, again, that can uh, uh, cause micromanagement of those people that aren't as good as that hero employee. And again, you're not leveraging the strengths of all of the people of why you hired them. So some of the solutions and actionable steps that we discussed were Start small by delegating tasks and allowing team members to make decisions autonomously. Uh, encourage a culture of open communication where team members feel safe to contribute ideas and provide leadership training on how to effectively delegate and trust teams. This is an important one, um, creating a more empowered work environment. And then one more uh, topic area theme that we've covered in the show uh, the, the topic was innovation paralysis. So fear of change and of new ideas. Like it's, I've heard this, it's so cliche and yet I've heard it so many times, uh, which is like, that's not the way that we work here. Or, you know, we don't do that thing here. And so they're just, uh, that's shutting down any improvements to anything that you're doing. Uh, so many projects stall because teams or organizations are resistant to change, often stemming from a fear of failure or comfort with the status quo. This innovation paralysis can hinder progress and prevent the adoption of new, more effective 
practices. So Sharon and I, in that episode, we talked about uh, some of the cultural issues like resistance to change is often tied to organizational values that prioritize stability over innovation. And this has been so many books written on this, uh, that the whole like agile movement, this idea of iterating, of failing fast, having a culture where people are allowed to learn from mistakes, don't penalize them, don't beat them up and just call out and you know uh, make them miserable over mistakes, but recognize this is a mistake, this is something we need to go and do, but focus on the path forward, the next thing. Obviously, there's big mistakes that need to be done, and sometimes people need to be let go. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the learning experiences. And far too few organizations that I've worked with, certainly, that I've consulted for, have that kind of culture where there's not fear that, hey, if I even do a minimal slip up, that something that's going to be negative. Um, you need to allow people to make mistakes, learn from that, and grow. Um, you know, muscle can't grow unless it's been broken down, torn down. Um, so uh, some of the cultural issues, resistance to change. So it's, uh, oh, I've talked about that. So it's often tied to organizational values that prioritize, prioritize stability over innovation. And leadership may unintentionally discourage new ideas by maintaining rigid, outdated processes. We've got a future episode where we're going to talk about, um, you know, bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy, people that are very process oriented and then innovation can't get can't happen things get stifled i worked with an organization where they're in their sales organization i wasn't in sales but in their sales or, or organization um they uh, so they acquired a company the company that i worked for so we're in this new larger company and we had uh, a bunch of our customers we had all these new products that we didn't we weren't selling before at the previous company we added our products into the mix. So a bunch of our best salespeople started calling up existing happy customers and saying, hey, we're now part of this larger company. We've got all of these other uh, uh, products that we can sell. And they made some huge sales where they didn't even demo these other products, but because they trusted these salespeople uh, and the salespeople said, hey, I think that you need this other product. They said, okay, we want to purchase. The new organization said, not so fast. Like we need to go through a whole assessment to make sure that this customer really needs that. And they lost several huge deals because of the bureaucracy. And they lost several really good salespeople because they had the way that they had always done things was this process. And it wasn't very dynamic. Um, so that's that's an example of that. So some of the solutions, some of the actionable steps that we talked about, uh, build a strong case for change by communicating the benefits of new ideas clearly to stakeholders. Of course, you need to have a, a, you know, an, the, the right audience for that. Um, so one of the things that uh, I've always run uh, different organizations like a governance body, we've got the stakeholders that might meet every two weeks or every month where we go through the various new projects and you talk about, hey, here's this, this is the impact, this is what we think the stakeholder impact is, make the case for, make a decision with that with that group. Um, and again, we changed the culture, we built that into the culture, so people knew coming in, you know, the case was made, here's the ROI, here's the cost, here are the risks of not moving forward. Um, we had those discussions, and so we were able to move very quickly on change. Um, encourage experimentation and create a safe environment where team members can fail without fear of repercussions. So that's another example. So, uh, you know, pilot, 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 have a culture where people are willing to go and try things, learn from it, take away, Hey, this is what we can do. Can't do, um, again, then discuss it with the body, understand the full impacts. Like I might go in with, uh, with my IT perspective of here's what I think the impacts are. Some of the business groups may say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, you change that. Here's how it affects my business and what I'm doing. And so it, it, you, know, you would not know that in IT unless you were you had that exchange, had that conversation with those other organizations. Um, so by experimenting and trialing those things out, you can root out a lot of potential future risks and mitigate those risks. 
and then foster continuous improvement by regularly reviewing processes and identifying areas where change is needed. And so this is, again, I mean, it worked with a couple of companies. This goes back into the late 90s, where on an annual basis, they did a system design review. They looked at their org chart. They looked at how project teams were working. Everything was open to discussion about what's working, what's not working, what do we need to adjust here on an annual basis that was part of the rhythm of the business. So by addressing these topics and more, uh, so the, again, the, the whole scope of the show of Project Failure fi Files is to provide insights that help teams and leaders navigate the complexities of project management, all while focusing on uh, long-term success through cultural uh, awareness and practical application. And it really comes down to that. It's, it's practical application. This isn't just theory. Sharon and I are talking about stuff we've been through all the things and we're sharing these actual stories um so uh, again it makes me feel old um, the gray hair is coming in um but uh, these are all uh you know real experiences with each of these areas and that's about all i wanted to share uh for this episode so i hope you found this useful um the collab talk podcast of course um will be back next week uh every thursday i publish new episodes I've already got three in the can. So, uh, you know, closing out the rest of this month um, and into next month, I've got more guests that have been booked. So that is a weekly podcast every Thursday. So be sure to subscribe uh, across, follow on your favorite podcast platform. The videos are also available out on YouTube and you can check out my blog at buckleyplanet.com. And if you're not already there watching this or listening to this, um, you can find it all there as well. And uh, the, the video versions, uh, of course, uh, uh, available all over the place and have links back to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, my summary out on the, the blog as well. And if you're interested in the topic today, the project failure files, uh, be sure to join one of our live streams, which is every single Monday morning, rain or shine uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific. And we simulcast that. It goes out. It's You don't have to register. You can just go and join it, um, book it on the calendar. If you go to LinkedIn, it's nice there. It'll do the calendar reminder and it'll do a bunch of the reminders. But, you know, YouTube and Facebook and uh, Twitter, you'll see it in all those places. Um, go live at 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, so please join us. I encourage you, if you're not already uh, subscribed to subscribe to the YouTube and to the podcast and share your feedback. And with that, that's all I've got. Thanks a lot for watching or listening. Uh, see you next time. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.